listening to White The Truck. Yeah, right on cue. Hey, welcome everybody to What The Truck on this beautiful Monday, Monday afternoon. A little help from outside there, outside Freight Alley here in downtown Chattanooga. I'm Michael Vincent, the dude, and he's Dooner. Dooner, what's up, my friend? Hey, man, I hear the other oh, sirens coming by, <laughs> coming for yeah, you. They hit the horn right on cue, bro. It was perfect. They always do. It's Market <laughs> Street in Chattanooga. There's always some sort of siren going on, especially when it turns into showtime. They're always there for us in prime time. But you know what? I was rewatching Friday's episode of What the Truck, and uh, I was kind of laughing at ourselves because we thought that that was a violin behind uh, Scott Berglechner. And I was cl- it's clearly like on a big screen TV. It was clearly like an upright bass. It would have been like a violin yeah. for a giant. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we didn't we didn't like see it there and then call it an oboe or anything like that. So it wasn't quite that bad. And in fairness, the, the perspective was was kind of off, but uh, it was a little bit weird, but uh, not as bad as the whole happy uh, birthday uh, fiasco, which was totally my bad, Dooner. <laughs> you know, it, it was nice to bring it. Though. I shared it with Andrew Silver. He had a uh, he had a good time. We talked it out. We had a nice chat. It was uh it was really nice, but hey, you know, another guest of ours that was on just recently, and we were talking about uh, TikToking truckers um, uh, a few weeks ago. I, what episode was that? Well, uh, maybe two weeks ago, we had uh, Trucker Beetle Bailey on. Well, he was out on the road, and he saw something. He saw something really wild flying up in the sky in Pennsylvania, over uh, by I seventy six West by a mile marker one hundred and fifty. He sent me the video. Let's take a look at it. Whoa! Anybody see that flash of light? Something just came streaking across the sky. Yeah, me I didn't know what the hell it was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Man. <laughs> that was out of control, man. <laughs> yeah, big meteor. Big, I, you see wild stuff when you're out there on the road, and it's kind of... Remember, like, back in uh, a few years ago, all the viral videos of stuff you'd see on the road would come from Russia because everybody had dash cams, but now in the U.S. Yeah. with, like, all drivers having dash cams, we're getting, uh, you know, we're getting plenty of uh, content from the streets out there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it happened to me when I was in Naples coming back from visiting my kids and, and the shuttle was actually taken off. And you can see that thing take off, especially when it's a nighttime launch or a dark launch from Miami. You can see it from Naples. You can see it. I'm packing a car up and I look up and see this blaze light going up. And I'm thinking, what in the world is that? But <laughs> it's a pretty wild video. Brandon Ferrer is in the comments says exciting stuff. Paul Sobrowski says happy Monday, everyone. And Wayne Craig says, hey, guys, South Haven, Michigan. I'm in the grocery store and I'm lost. You know, I can help you out with that. I used to have this idea that I, I don't have the technical skills to launch, but like indoor GPS, right? You could use it at conferences, maybe in grocery stores and malls, wherever you're going. Wayne Craig could use that. He wouldn't be lost uh, over by the eggs. <laughs> you could use it right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. where, are the beans? where are the beans? <laughs> All right, man. Let's uh, let's tip the band right now. Try and pay brokers with sh- try and pay partners with brokers and shippers to process carrier payments with nearly eighty thousand carriers pay. Try and pay provides a simple solution for your carriers to manage their payments in one place. With Try and Pay, carriers can upload and submit paperwork, manage their payments, and connect to brokers directly from anywhere. To learn more, tell them, dude. Go to TriumphPay.com immediately after this program. Talk to our friends here at Try and Pay. Wow. And then Rhonda says, morning delay getting you up. I guess so, right? It is Monday. Yeah, that happens. It, it is, is Monday. Monday. It is Monday. Well, I'll go at the same pace here, right? Turn uh, turn your resistance knob, Rhonda, a little bit to the right. I'll do a little Cody Rigsby here and turn your cadence up to an 80 to 100, and we'll be good. All right, let's get, to some, go. let's get to some headlines. Keona D. Carter, greetings, everybody. It's my birthday and listening in on the best broadcast. Ooh, oh, man, Keona, do you want us to do a rendition of happy birthday for you? We'll see if we have time at the end of the show. We'll make it our thing. <laughs> All right, man, we will see. And here's Zach Strickland posed this. He does a chart of the week on Freeway. It's a great article where he breaks down what's going on in Sonar and distills it and tries to give a little bit of a forward outlook while also looking backwards about how this happened. And his article over the weekend was, will we see, will we see double-digit rate increases in transportation? And he, uh, he was saying one of the biggest questions surrounding transportation is how spot rates will affect next year's contracts as rates average 20 to 30 percent higher than 2019 over the past three months. Yeah, absolutely correct. And looking at the CAS and the producers pricing index, along with our outbound tender uh, reject index, you see that OTRI or outbound tender rejects was uh, averaged about 12 percent year to date. 
But nearly 22 percent since July 1st is where it really caught fire. And, uh, you know, based on the last three years, which admittedly isn't a, 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 a lot uh, of, an, a, of a sample, uh, but rate increases should be in the range of about four to six percent, depending on how the fourth quarter pans out is, is what he's saying there. Oh, a couple of people are saying there's buffering delays on LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn Live has, uh, it's been really kind of awful these past couple of weeks, hasn't it, guys? You can always go to FreightWaves.com, though. These things are simulcast right to there, and that's a, that's the purest version. We don't have as much communication as you guys get here. But if you want a non-buffered version, FreightWaves.com is always going to kick LinkedIn Live's butt, usually, right? I would say so. Yeah. Very, a, true. A double, Very true. A double-digit rate increase does not seem likely at this point, looking at the data alone. But there will be a lot of questions, right, Michael Vanson, answered in these coming months around continued stimulus, the election, and unemployment, and how that's going to swing things. But we're also talking about a uh, an anonymous year with a black swan event. So it's hard to exactly say what this date is going to mean for 2021. What are you looking at? Yeah, so I'm kind of in 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 uh, Zach's camp. There's a lot of argument to say it could hit double digits, but I don't think that's going to be the case. But uh, you know, depending on what the rates do, what happens here in the fourth quarter, of course, you've got to understand that you've got to look at the entire year, the seasonality throughout the entire year, to look at what the contracted rates should be out for the next, you know, 12 months or even you know even six month cycles. It's not the, just the fourth quarter. You got to look at the results, and kind of you know. Where is the economy going next year? Will this uh, will this stay up here with the the change in uh, growth in e-commerce, et cetera, putting a lot of pressure on uh, on the supply chains? I would imagine that pressure is going to stay there. And so four to six is pretty good. I would put it more a little bit north of that myself. I'd be in the five, seven, maybe eight percent range is what I'm thinking. And do you think you're being conservative there or just realistic? I think I'm being realistic, right? I mean, you can't if if it it dies off at the end of the year. Uh, it depends on what that die off is. Is it economic or is it because of a cycle pattern? Is it is it the pandemic? We know that there was the event last year that really brought things way up. I'm not so sure that that is uh, you know, it's not representative of a of a normal year if you, you we have a normal year. Um, but you got to you got to kind of smooth some of those stuff out for those contracted rates. And then you got to look at both sides. They don't want to set it too low and then jump and have their carriers jump out when uh, if things peak up. And uh, the reverse is also true. So you, you got to look at those pressures. You don't necessarily want that rate to be as low or as high as you can possibly get it because it puts yeah. dangers into the waterfall effect. Gotcha. Uh, Sherman Barnes says, love that shirt. Timothy Dinner. Thank you very much. Just being celebrated. It's October. It's my favorite month. Love, love the fall. Love Halloween. Football's in. Full swing, I hope. I don't know. Cam Newton's got COVID. Titans have COVID. Hopefully, you know, that doesn't all go to hell over there. And we still get a season. Yeah. Aaron Smedic said, is that a Peloton behind you, Dooner? Yes, it is. In fact, a Peloton. You want to ride with me along with uh, Cody Rigsby, my guy on the <laughs> on the Peloton thing? Uh, we can join the uh, Elite Freight team along with uh, the other winners at our recent virtual events. Yeah, I was going to say, what about Nick Bruce? He's got a new one coming. Yeah, and uh, Charlie Square Jr., he's got one too. Amazon, yeah. here we go, another headline. Amazon's creating a 75-day peak season. Mark Solomon, he's doing some MVP reporting as he's showing up uh, multiple times in our news reports today. The dawn of a new type of peak season is fast approaching courtesy of a usual suspect. Amazon's so big now, always making waves, and their big decision to do Prime Day this month, October 14th and 15th. Not sure if y'all knew that. It's usually, what, in July, June or July. Now it is October 13th and 14th, and this is going to extend peak season into October, then November, and, and, and December. It's uh, causing some big ripples. What are you seeing there? Yeah, so I mean, in the article, he, he, it, it effectively what it does is the, the move effectively kicks off the 2020 peak season about 30 to 45 days earlier than normal. Krieg said in an interview on Friday, what's more, uh, Amazon's ability to condition customers to its changes and the need for competitors to keep up with its trail means an earlier peak uh, not just by one year and not, not and not just a one year event. It could be an earlier peak moving forward as they get people to adapt to this more. Uh, so it's very interesting what they're doing there at Amazon. Yeah. And, it, you know, that makes that forecasting even harder when you're looking towards 2021, because this is going to this can affect the data quite significantly, especially as other retailers try to compete with Amazon and they shift the windows of their stores. I'm sure you're going to be seeing Walmart start putting out deals very soon. Target, Best Buy, all the usual suspects are now going to have to play the same game of all that that um, 
that Amazon's doing. But Krieg, he says that consumers should expect the average holiday orders. Here's the big news. He said you should expect the average holiday order to take seven to 10 days this year. So get your orders in early, high likelihood of delays, especially those kind we're seeing at the beginning beginning of the pandemic, where prime delivery windows are just straight out the window. Um, that's on their speculation, but it does seem likely with the amount of volume we will be having. I know that they're stocking up with a lot of workers. Yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great point with those possible delays and you know this this move forward many people think you know Amazon is doing this type this thing and they're going to drive things forward and they're taking advantage and everybody's now got to struggle to keep up but it's not necessarily a bad thing for for uh, you know all the players in the pre holiday season as you mentioned here the delays you move it forward 30 to 45 days everybody can play in that theoretically, given those, you know, week to Let's week call our uh, guests, Michael. delays to get things moved. So. Yeah. I mean, all good points. Let's call our guests. Let's stick to time here. Brian Kempersey. Oh, sorry. We're going to call out to him. He's over at Port X Logistics in uh, Bozeman, Montana. See what he's up to. They're, they're dealing with that just in time. If you've been to some virtu- virtual events, one of the big debates there was the, the just in time versus just in case. But Port X Logistics dealing with a lot of those just in time shipments. Brian, thank you for joining us on the air today. Uh, pleasure to be here. You are a uh, you're a golden griffin from Canassus College. Is that true? Uh, Canisius College. Canisius. But yeah. Yes, Canisius. I am a golden griffin. <laughs> Michael, I knew it was Canisius, Brian. I actually played it. I played uh, football at Mercyhurst University, just down the road there from uh, from Buffalo. I, I played against uh, Canisius a, a few times back when you guys still had a football team. Beautiful. Well, hey, you are the founder. You're the founder of Port X Logistics. So introduce yourself. And I always, you know, you're a founder. You have a unique perspective. Why did you start Port X? Um, Well, we founded it. um, There was a group of us. um, You know, I was one of the leaders of the group, but uh, a group of us that that came together with uh, a history and transportation of, you know, really what we thought was semi lackluster service, um, non proactive communication outdated technology. Um, and we really wanted to put, um, multiple components together of culture, service, technology, um, our own assets, um, and just do it in a a different way. Um, especially in the drayage industry, we felt it was fairly fragmented. Um, and this is a way for us to kind of put all the pieces together for our customers and grow organically. Aaron, all great points. And you know, the, 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 uh, the, the industry ripe for that type of thought process and that type of innovation. Um, I'm interested, though, what kind of challenges uh, did you see in just in time this year? Um, well, it's very geographic based, being that um, we have offices on the East Coast and West Coast and assets uh, and owner ops uh, scattered throughout the U.S. There were certain pockets on the East Coast that really um, were were not impacted very much. And then uh, the West Coast uh, has been a completely different animal. The advent of the fast boats, Madison's had their fast boat for a long time. Um, then the APL fast boat program, now the Zim fast boat program. And all of these um, beneficial cargo owners in the U.S. wanted to get freight expedited into their either production or fulfillment supply chains. Um, air freight capacity was limited. Um, and then, um, you know, they, they started putting all this uh, fast boat freight on. And once that hit the shores on the West Coast, um, our services for drayage, transloading and trucking and expediting the final destination was uh, was in high demand. Erin Smedic, she says, my sister went to Mercyhurst, small world. And Keona Carter says online orders are going to be insane this year. Yeah. R- right before you came on, we were talking about Amazon kind of extending the 75 day peak season with uh, with Prime Day. It's been a wild year. You guys deal with drayage, transloading, trucking tech. How do you put all those pieces together under this umbrella you call Port X? Um, well, we started the company, you know, first and foremost, we knew what culture we wanted to create. Um, we knew the standard operating procedures that were going to be uh, imperative. And, and one of the things in the drayage world that just communicate, 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 and always be proactive because it seems like in that market segment, you are always digging for, for data from these, um, you know, small to medium sized fragmented companies. And we just wanted to put that um, all out on the table and, and get that done up front. And we were very fortunate uh, in our search for tech. Um, you know, I had met one of the founders of a company called Turvo, um, and we were able to work with Turvo and they were able to customize some uh, software to fit our business. And that's really helped propel us uh, to the next level. 
So, Brian, it's interesting that you mentioned Turbo. I know Jeff D'Angelo have had him on uh, freight forecasting a, a, a couple times and a couple other shows here. But from your perspective, tell, tell our audience Turbo and what that relationship is. What does that do? Well, I had met Jeff. Um, so, first, shout out to, to Port X. We just turned three years old oh. on Friday, October second. Hey. So, oh, see, um, Michael, Michael, you should have been singing "Happy Birthday" to him instead of <laughs> instead of Andrew Silver and Molo like you did. <laughs> Here, I'll, here's a little cowbell for you, though. Little three year cowbell. <laughs> there you go. So, so I had met Jeff before we had started Port X, and um, you know, we just had a a, a really good. Uh, relationship. And I think the vision was in the same, was in alignment uh, with what Turbo wanted to do and what Portax wanted to do. Uh, first and foremost, the the platform that they built, how it's user-friendly, how it's collaborative, and how it has a driver app built in. So you're not going to a secondary, um, you know, GPS tracking site we thought was great. Um, and Turbo out of the gate wasn't necessarily built for drayage. Um, and Jeff was willing to take a chance on us as a multimodal drayage transloading and trucking company. Um, and we took a bit of a chance on them back in 2017 that they were going to come through and build out uh, the, the multiple legs, um, container types, equipment types, and all those things. And, um, you know, they've been, they've been spot on for us and just uh, a really great partner. Um, and, and as we do business, we do business with a lot of containerized cargo, uh, multinational freight forwarders and NVOCCs. So um, Turbo and their links and their tenants allow somebody in Germany, Long Beach, Dallas to see uh, location, documents, photos of transloads all in real time at the same time. Um, And that's a real differentiator for us. We were talking about we were talking earlier in the show during one of our headlines, Zach Strickland's chart of the week. He was proposing the idea, the debate that's going on in logistics, or at least what people are looking ahead towards. Are there going to be double digit percentage increases in rates next year? What are your hopes and predictions before we get there, though, for Q4? Uh, Big holiday season coming up, a lot of online orders. What are your predictions? Uh, Yeah, we call it hopes and dreams, right? So, um, you know, our business model is based upon. Um, you know, a little bit of chaos. So we want a bit of chaos in the market. So there's a need for time, nef- definite drayage, transloading and trucking solutions. Um, you know, having said that, you know, our hopes are everybody stays uh, healthy for the fourth quarter and, um, you know, business continues to flow. Um, I think the West Coast, specifically LA, is going to um, still see its challenges with uh, port operations and just the sheer amount of cargo moving through there. So I think your drayage and your trucking rates out of LA um, are going to continue to be high. I think people are going to look for alternatives on how to avoid some of that congestion and get faster sailings from Asia. Um, So that could be using the Canadian ports of Prince Rupert and Vancouver and then trucking out of there. Um, And on the East coast, I see things, um, starting to ramp up that the East coast hasn't been hit, um, like the West coast has. And we start to see things like Norfolk and Savannah, um, starting to pick up with more all water imports and more Asia imports. Um, you know, and another shout out to our crew. Um, we recently opened up in Savannah and, uh, they're starting to receive trucks down there in the Savannah marketplace as well. So that's one area that we, we see, um, starting to pick up as the Southeast and, and the West Coast should remain strong through the end of the year and likely right into Chinese New Year, I think. Yeah, excellent stuff, Brian. I, I'm sure you've seen the news about Amazon kind of bringing forward the peak season about 35, 30 to 45 days here, October 13th, 14th. Uh, we have about a minute here yet, but re- really, really quickly, what are, what are your thoughts on that and the, the effect that that will have uh, bringing that 70 day peak, 75 day peak season? Uh, it's just the new way of the world. And we partner with uh, uh, clients that do business with Amazon. We see it in our business. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, just just the way that Amazon works, this is going to be, you know, what they're calling their peak season of uh, these 75 days, but just the, the way that the consumers are purchasing uh, in the new COVID environment, I think that this is going to be extended. There may be some highs and lows and maybe it drops off a little bit in January, but I think generally what becomes peak season for Amazon becomes their new normal. 
And then the growth picks up after that. And we, we just see that phenomenon con- continuing. Brian Kempesty, he is the founder of Port X Logistics. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. People, if you want to learn more about Port X, go to portxlogistics.com. Thanks again, Brian. All right. Thanks, guys. We appreciate it. Wow. Good time talking to him. A lot of challenges in the space that uh, that he is in. Our next guest, too, is our next guest is Dan, the driver with road transportation. He's in that reefer space. Another area with uh, with plenty of challenges in its own right, especially especially if he starts getting involved in medical polls or something like that. I mean, when you talk about the bringing a vaccine right to the United States, you're not just talking about time sensitive. You're talking about super temperature sensitive items, things like that. But right now we're talking to Dan, the driver. Dan, thanks for joining doing a dude on what the truck. It's about time we got you on here. Yeah, all right. Here I am. What's up? <laughs> What's happening, man? You're uh, where are you? You're in, you're in Evansville, Indiana, man. What do you think of uh, Philip Rivers? Of who? F- Philip Rivers, man. The Colts' new QB. You're not an NFL guy. No, I, I mean I've been a truck driver all my life. I've never had time to watch sports. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, he throws some. Uh, he throws some spectacular interceptions. Some of the uh, most unlikely you'll see in the game. Well, introduce yourself, Dan. You've been driving. You've been driving for a long time. You're also the owner of Road Transportation. You do some reefer. Tell us a little bit about your background. And not much, really. Uh, whenever I was a kid, I wanted to drive a truck, and nobody would hire me because I was too young. So I just <laughs> went out and bought one. And, uh, first, uh, couple of years I was driving, I had fake IDs and fake this and <laughs> fake this. And I just sort of faked it all along. Wow. How old, wait, how old were you? Uh, whenever I bought my first truck, I was 19 years old, which okay. is too young, too young to drive interstate, of course, you know, so. You, you were like that kid I in did. Ireland, like that five-year-old that had his dad driving, yeah. no. <laughs> dad driving him on TikTok. Okay. <laughs> 19 not so bad. Yeah, not quite that bad. <laughs> That's crazy. Dan, Mike Vincent here. Very nice to meet you, man. So uh, tell us, what's what's going on with the uh, reefer world right now besides like uh, one in two loads being rejected right now? Demand's pretty high, yeah? Yeah, it's pretty much business as usual. For me, uh, I uh, haul probably uh, 60% contract and not too much in the spot, you know, right now, so. Uh, I don't really keep up with what's going on in the spot market. I run from Indiana down to Florida every week. And Florida, nine months out of the year, is always a hard market coming back. So, you know, I'd say it's just pretty much business as usual. Dan, this is a ridiculous question, but one of my trucking friends wanted me to ask you it. I'm not sure if it means anything to you, but consider it anyway. You ever wonder if you've ate a chicken that had laid an egg that you've also eaten? You know, that's really pretty deep. I've never thought about that. Because <laughs> I, I haul eggs and I haul chickens, you know, and, and I'm not surely I'm not sure which one came first. <laughs> hey, well, tell us a little bit about... Uh, I tell you, whenever you eat an egg, you got one less chicken that you're going to haul tomorrow, right? <laughs> that's true. The problem. So how did you? So how did you build? How did you build row out? So you're 19 years old. You decide to get the truck. You're driving illegally, but eventually you go legit. You you start a business. You get into reefer. How'd you get into the space? And, and how did the business evolve for you? Uh, I've been in the reefer now since about 2004. I done reefer off and on earlier, uh, but uh, been steady in it since about 2004. I guess. Uh, I was leased to a drive-in carrier, and uh, the guy that was a dispatcher bought the company and quit dispatching and hired some dispatchers, and my revenue went down. And so I just told him, you know, I'm going to go get a reefer and get my authority and do my own thing. And he was a nice guy. He said, well, you can still run under my authority and do your own thing. So I did that till about 2008 when he went out of business and then I got my own authority in 2008 and just been in the spot market a lot. I've had, uh, I've got a really good customer right now that I worked for actually when I was a kid, drove a route truck for him, you know? And, uh, so it's just, you know, you just talk to people. It's, you know, business is about relationships. 
Amen. Amen. Hey, Dan, I've got a, a, a much less deep question, but one that I think the audience really needs to hear anyways. Uh, the answer to is, well, it's two parts, really. One, can you share the recipe for those turbo kidney beans you used to cook back in the day on your turbo? And, and, and two, what's the strangest thing you ever cooked on that turbo? Actually, uh, kidney beans and soup's the only thing I've ever cooked up there. And I've heard of a lot of a lot of people cooking other things. They wrap it in tin foil and put it up there. But I never was that adventurous. I'd just throw me a can up there on a the turbo and drive for about a half an hour, and it'd be nice and hot whenever you got right open the can and eat it. <laughs> well, it serves you. hey man i mean in terms of like driver hell cooking for yourself on the road that you know that's that's got to be a big deal so you're not eating like sabaro every single meal or a uh, beef jerky right no no i say i eat a lot of beans and now i've got a refrigerator i carry lunch meat with me and salad stuff like that you know I'm a truck driver. I basically eat a lot of crap, you know. But <laughs> we all we all got to we all got to die sometime, I guess. Well, I've got some red meat for you. <laughs> so I got I got some red meat for you. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of pulling reefer, though, you know, I remember when I used to work in perishable fish. I felt like a lot of times shippers I would work with they didn't fully understand the dynamics of reefer versus just regular dry van. What uh, what do you find yourself educating people about when it comes to reefer? When it comes to reefer, uh, basically, is uh, it's it's a cold chain. You know, you got to be sure not break the cold chain. You got to, you got to know your temperatures, check your temperatures, you know, because everything's just temperature sensitive with a reefer. You know, you got to, you got to CYA, you got to cover your butt when you're loading. You got to make sure what you're picking up. If it's supposed to be 38 degrees, you got to make sure it's 38 degrees and not 44 degrees. Because when you get to the other end, you'll have problems. Yeah, it's your fault no matter how it was when you picked it up if you don't keep that documentation that's going on there. Dan, I'm, I'm interested, uh, you know, we've got hours of service changes coming in. Do you have thoughts on that? The hours of service, I wish they would just leave them alone. You know, pick something and be done with it. It's, you know, when you put it all in a nutshell, it's still 70 hours in an eight-day week, you know. It's what it was back when I started driving 40 years ago. And the hours was fine then, and the hours is fine now, but just, you know, trying to keep up with all the nuances is what causes trouble. Yeah, we recently had an article, I, I believe it was published on Friday, and it was talking about the changes that came through on the 29th with the 8-2 and the 7-3 split. And it was saying that sometimes when changes like this happen, they actually end up putting a lot of drivers in noncompliance just because they're not familiar with the rules. And each ELD handles how that is administrated, administered differently. Um, do you do you see yourself encountering such problems or is this something that's just easy to adapt to? But it's not really the, the right change. Yeah, it's easy to adapt to. Uh, you know, it's it's all been easy to adapt to. You just got to read it and know what you're dealing with and, you know, uh, conduct yourself accordingly. Yeah, I have to agree with you. Yes. Well, Matt Henning, he, 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 well, Matt, hold on. So Matt Henning said, always use technology and telematics or refrigeration monitoring. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about that, that virus, uh, transporting the virus, which it sounds like you pull eggs, so you may not be in that medical cold chain, but I've heard that up to 20% of viruses at some point, you talked about not breaking that cold chain, spoil because that cold chain is broken and the amount of temp the temperature controlling them is uh, that window is so small. Yeah, you know, bacteria grows uh, above 40 degrees, you know. So when you're hauling chilled product, you know, if, if it, you know, we have, used to, we didn't have such the temperature monitoring as we have now. Everything's got temp trackers in it now. And, uh, you know, it's if you go above 40 degrees, you know, bacteria just multiplies. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt, Dan. Hey, Dan, you are we're out of time here, but it was it was wonderful talking with you. How do people connect with you? How do they learn more about Roe if they need their their eggs pulled or uh, whatever it may be? Uh, email Dan, the driver six to a gmail dot com. Uh, that's about it. Uh, you know, been in business for a long time. A lot of people know me and I've stayed busier than an honest man should well dan thank you very much for your time today we appreciate it and uh well i mean after you turned 19 right and you, and you went legit <laughs>
Right. <laughs> hey, I don't blame you. Sometimes you got to just do your own thing. You know, if they don't want to let you in the club, sometimes you got to make your own club, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right, brother, take it easy. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> He's a good guy. Hey, that's what I do with podcasting. Nobody would give me a podcast. Nobody would employ me to do a podcast. I just had to start my own, Michael Vincent. That's what I did. There you go, man. Just make it happen. Just make it happen. Necessity. Don't let people stop you. You know, if they say you no, can't be on the no, guest no. list, make your own list. That's right. right. Get your own list. Drive forward. Move on. Hey, we got to do a show. Adapt. We got to we got to tip another band here. Fredo's. Uh, you may be stuck working remotely, right? Who's not doing that? But as the world goes digital, it's time for every aspect of your business to catch up, even your international freight. Fredos.com propels business growth with smooth shipping solutions, allowing you to compare, book, and manage your shipments all in one place. Plus, with reviews by fellow importers and transparent performance tracking, you can ship with confidence. As a What the Truck listener, you get $100 towards your first shipment of $1,000 or more. Just go to Fredos.com slash WTT and use code FR8 podcast. That's Freight Podcast to sign up. That's right. $100 off your first shipment. Pretty good deal, Michael. There you go. Yeah, absolutely a good deal. There you go. Want to play Stay it forward? Use the great podcast. Want to play it forward? Yeah, I do. All right, let's, let's dial. Let's dial Jose Socorro. He's transportation supervisor, Central States. Hello. Manif- hey, Jose, you are a one ring answer guy. I like it, man. Right on the ball. Yeah, man, he's on it. <laughs> You're not like Harrison. Every time I call up Harrison, it sounds like uh, I just disturbed him while he's watching like DuckTales on a Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> So are you going to show a picture of the instrument and let us guess like we tried to that oh, violin man. or stand-up bass last week? Or Yeah. Jose, we had an embarrassing moment for, for, for people here who promote music and that stuff. We thought a, uh, an upright bass was a, was a violin, but we blame our in-studio monitor. It's hard to see depth on that thing. That's impressive. <laughs> so that's high up the beholder mindset. So there you go. All right. So you uh, let, let's play your song, then we'll dive into it. So guys in the back, can you play the clip of uh, Jose playing? Let's, let's see what it is, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Was that the Pink Panther theme? That actually uh, Smoke on the Waters. Oh, okay. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say, I love that. I didn't know you were in Deep Purple, bro. <laughs> Sweet. So that's like one of the first songs I ever played when I started playing saxophone uh, back uh, in fifth grade in New Jersey. Oh, and so I've never forgotten that song. Yona Fisher, she's uh, she's right there with me. She said, who hears the Pink Panther? Okay, maybe not. I was hearing a little no, Pink Panther man, in there. I, I heard Smoke on the Water, dude. I thought it was quite brave to to whip out Smoke on the Water on a, on a saxophone. Ooh. That's pretty sweet. Powerful stuff. Thank well, you, Michael. Well, you know, one of the reasons he did is not only is he just a transportation supervisor at Central States Manufacturing, not only is he a former J.B. Hunt employee, but he plays saxophone and you've DJed weddings before, too, right? How do you find time for logistics? I did. How do you find time for logistics? Well, logistics is Monday through Friday. When I was at JB Hunt, it was seven days a week. So I just, between emails and playing uh, killer beats and making Bride's Days wonderful, I manage all that. <laughs> now with Central States, it's a, it's a new schedule, basically Monday to Friday. And so I'm able to do the weddings on the weekends and not worry about uh, putting out fires. Interesting, so. interesting. You know, it's a lot to juggle. I I, I play uh, instrument as well. I play guitar and bass and and juggling. I find it to be very very soothing. But you know, what's not soothing to me is is rude a rude waiter. You know, uh, they got to be pretty rude before I'll jump on. But how rude does a rude waiter have to be before you're going to say something to him? 
I, I practice patience. I, I try to understand they need a job too, and they, they're doing their best. And then there's other times where I, I will make a statement. I used to just walk up to the server, like leave, leave the table, walk up to the server and let them know what's going on. Uh, but since I've been married, my wife doesn't like that. So I have to practice self-control and patience and forgiveness. So, uh, when it comes to the rude waiter, uh, <laughs> I just, I just am a benevolent person. Well, I, as a former waiter, I thank you. Uh, as you can tell, Michael Vince and I spun the wheel of stupid questions before today's show. So, hey, wait, so Central States Manufacturing, this is really interesting because you guys deal with like like uh, metal roofing and siding and that kind of stuff. So what what is what's the difference between working transportation there versus J.B. Hunt? Well, with J.B. Hunt, it's brokerage. Yeah, I'm working with all kinds of customers. I'm talking to a carrier to move my freight from point A to point B with central states. We have different locations throughout the country and we're sending products from the 10 plants that central states has all over the country to customers within a certain region. Uh, the difference as well will be is in my new role, I'm actually managing drivers directly, central state drivers, uh, managing their hours of service, their payroll, uh, setting up their routes for whether it's a day run or over the road run. So there's more hands-on with the driver's aspect as is where J.B. Hill works, 3PL. I'm basically talking to third-party carriers to move freight. Excellent. So, you know, in, in my former days, I used to haul a lot of uh, bizarre products, uh, you know, overhead doors and that type of stuff. Very, we, we used to say, you know, there's there's no such thing as ugly freight, just poorly freight, uh, poorly priced freight, right, is, is what it was. But... So what are the challenges for a company like Central State? You're, you're producing, what is it? Your metal roofing is at least one of your products, one of your main products there. Uh, so what kind of, right. what so, kind of idiosyncrasies are there? What's the difficulties there? Absolutely. The difficulties will be a number of drivers compared to customer requests. Uh, we are a growing company. The, the plant that I'm managing out in Missouri is not even a year old. And so we're growing. And so trying to fill the orders with the number of drivers is one challenge. I mean, for the most part, we deal with panels, trim, purlin, and then metal roof components. So we're, we're mailing all kinds of stuff. I mean, we, we use kind of Soga flatbed trucks, which is the other thing. I, JB Hunt, I just work with 53 foot dry van. So coming to Central States, I'm having to learn and understand the flatbed world. And all I know is that kind of Sogas are much more convenient to use and a lot better than tarping a load. So that's the one plus for sure. But the, the challenge is definitely the product and drivers and then as well is trying to get every trying to hit all our drops within a day nice i mean that's like that's a good problem to have as long as you can ultimately fulfill the orders i mean too many delays obviously you know makes customers mad and all that that kind of stuff but goods are moving it sounds like you're having a pretty good year over there we're having a great year i mean i'm I'm walking in to pretty much an increase of demand from customers because of the pandemic and everyone want to do home projects. Uh, so I guess we can thank everyone who wants to work on home projects and companies that are fixing houses and roofs. So thank you to everyone for that. Uh, the, the, the one plus about coming into where I'm at, even though in some locations we may not have the drivers, I have a good support team of, of senior uh, supervisors that help me and we get some of our lull drivers to some of these plants and our lull plant for, for the record is our biggest plant and pr we produce a lot of things that some of our other plants can't produce so we have drivers that are we have a few team drivers that will transfer product from one plant to the other so there's nothing impossible that can't be done or solved or fixed uh, there's a really good team at central states here in the transportation division that can really uh, make things happen and resolve problems <laughs> I'm laughing because Michael Vincent's t typing on my sheet. Uh, we need to put more questions on the wheel, the, more questions on our wheel of stupid questions. We only just started the wheel of stupid <laughs> questions today, but uh, I think we may make that a regular thing on on Monday yeah, for guests. You, you're, you're our first contest. You are our first contestant on wheel of stupid questions. I know that I, was a good question. What about the what about the chicken? Have you like? Well, let's ask you the other stupid question we asked Dan the driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think that you've ever eaten a chicken? And also, whose who's egg? What was the question? Have you ever eaten a chicken whose egg you've also eaten? Do you think That's you a good question. <laughs> I don't think I have, but if we pull some data, maybe. Okay. But we need some uh, chicken telematics, my man. Well, <laughs> we I am do. in the chicken capital. I mean, I, maybe I can go to Tyson, and then maybe we can just test run. Like, see that egg? 
when you uh, when you when that egg gets produced, I'll buy it. And when that chicken gets cooked up, keep a track of it and get back to me. And then I'll let you guys know. So maybe I just need to hit up my friends at Tyson and see if they can collaborate with me on this project. Nice. Get us involved, man. Get us involved and then see if they have um, any sample questions for our Wheel of Stupid Questions we'll p- yeah. presented by Tyson. <laughs> we'll, That's right. It seems, we'll, to me, it seems to me you're going to need some blockchain technology to tr- keep track of all those eggs and chickens to make that happen. <laughs> you're going to need the blockchain. Right. You need the blockchain to serve my spicy wings. Thank you so much today. <laughs> Thank you so much today, Jose, for joining us on the air. How do people connect with you and how do they learn more? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can find me on jose.sakura at ymail.com or you can hit me up on LinkedIn and we can go from there. We can talk about public speaking, Toastmasters, marketing, branding, uh, how to contribute more questions to what the truck, you know, I'm your one stop shop. You are our Huckleberry. Thank you so much. And I uh, keep blowing that smoke on the water with that saxophone, my friend. And making Bride's Thank Days making Bride's Days happy too. Hmm. Take Every day. Right. Take that a few different ways, Very Jose. Important work. Jose, Very thank important you again. Work. <laughs> Thanks again, thank sir. You. Wow. It was good good to hear from Jose. He had been on back in uh I was looking back. It was I think he predates you joining the show, Michael Vincent. It was back in the back in the audio booth, which seems like forever ago. Oh yeah. I was never well, I was a uh, guest a couple times in the audio booth, but yeah, yeah. You, you cut your chops on some of the games over there. Um that's right. We got to do it, though. We got to make that wheel of stupid questions. And we also have to. <laughs> we have to have a wheel of stupid questions. I like it. Big deal. Little deal. Is it a big deal? Is it a big deal? Or a little deal? Am I a big deal? Not a little deal. Big deal. Big deal. All right. There's a big deal here. Emily Zink, what's up, girl? What's up, Sooner? You get a Peloton ride in today? <laughs> I, I, I'm getting one in after the show while I wait for the video to upload. That's, uh, that's part of my routine. I thought that's maybe how you got amped for the show. You hopped on the Peloton, did about 20 minutes, got ready, banged the cowbell, and that's how you got that energy. Hey, I'll tell you something about Cody Rigsby. So he has me doing these, like, weight. I've never done weights with, like, three-pound weights before. You know, I always, like, try to pick up the most heavy things I could possibly do and, like, max loads. But, like, he kicks your ass with these these three-pound exercises. They're really tough. You would know that as a fitness instructor. Guys, like, I'm telling you, you can do some, uh, you can do some build with some light weights. You high totally reps. can, especially if you're doing a lot of high reps with it. So I'm going to have you. You always talk about Cody Rigsby. So I'm going to have to get a Peloton <laughs> and hop on a bike and ride. I know John Kingston. He's one of our riders here. He also takes Cody's classes. So yeah. Cody gets a shout out and hopefully he becomes a What the Chuck fan. Maybe he watches you, Dooner. I'm just, you never know. I'm going to invite him on just so we can talk to myself, you and, and Rhonda in our audience. Awesome. I love it. Well, it is time for Big Deal, Little Deal. And Dooner, this one is starting with you. Both cash and confidence drive higher class eight orders in the month of September. Big deal or little deal? It's a big deal. I mean, it shows confidence in the market. I mean, the scary point in time back in like April and May, not only were you seeing spot rates be incredibly depressed, but that caused fleets to bear up. They were not expanding at the time. And that was causing a lot of people to have sort of a, a negative outlook and also made Craig's Fuller, Craig Fuller's bullish, you know, debate against Zach Strickland on May 5th almost seem really, really premature. Now, Craig was obviously right because he knows this business really well and, and he nailed it. And now we're seeing those returns too. His fleets realize they have to expand. There was 30,000 orders in September, right? Um, the surge to 32,000 units was the highest monthly total since October of 2019. Uh, and September bookings were 55% higher than average. So it's all it's all a really good outlook and a, and a big deal for this this market. Yeah, I, I agree with I agree with with uh, Duner. I was going to say highest uh, 32K is highest since uh, October 2019 shows a lot of confidence. A lot of those builds push into 2021. So uh, things remain the way they are. I think it's uh, the start of a big deal. American exporters won an end to erratic container return return dates. Excuse me. And Agriculture Transportation Coalition members say they are fired up and they are ready to fix this. Michael Vincent, big deal or little deal? Well, it, it's a big deal if they can get it fixed because you know what they're talking about there is is the lack of visibility and the lack of notification as to where these containers are and in moving those ag products. You know they've got to make certain deadlines to make sure those things ship and arrive overseas uh, on time, et cetera. And not having that visibility, they're moving things like uh, you know across country via intermodal that are arriving at a port that are going to be delayed in that port for a week or or longer. Uh, it's a big detriment to their building, uh, to their to their business, 
Uh, and obviously, this is something that is a concern within the supply chains and the flexibility of those supply chains and their ability to react to different events, black swan events included. As we saw earlier in this pandemic, uh, you know, where uh, the disruption in ocean, a lot of that was caused by repositioning containers, containers winding up in places where, you know, they couldn't find them because of the fragmentation of the, of the markets. They had a, a hard time rounding up those containers. So, uh, it's a big deal if you can get into uh, something that needs to be fixed, not only for the ag business, but overall supply chains. Yeah, I mean, I have to Michael hit on a lot of good points there. And, uh, you know, the only thing I would add to that is that when they want these containers, you have to have them back at the port one or two days before a ship arrives. But there has been so many delays. And look, this stuff's been happening since like the dawn of time in shipping. It's just exacerbated during these Black Swan events or it's exacerbated every single time there's a lot of volume coming into a port. But the end result is it makes it very difficult for people who need to bring those containers to customers. It makes it difficult to manage. It causes a lot of uh, money in storage fees, in delays, in strained relationships. It's a big challenge. And, you know, when people talk about a supply chain, they always think of sort of this, this sort of smooth running link thing, but it's, it, it's a rusty broadsword. I mean, there's, there's holes and links in the chain and one little snag can cause a lot of issues. And that's just one of them. And it's one that you would love to see tech resolve because it's been going on for so long. Recently, we reported on this next one on FreightWaves.com. Grimmett Brothers, they are a Texas-based carrier. They actually filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection despite being approved for $350,000 to a $1 million through the U.S. Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program. And according to court documents, this is actually the second time they have filed for bankruptcy protection in the past four years. Dooner, big deal or little deal? It's it's a big deal. I mean, this is another situation where we're having uh, and this company, as you mentioned, they've sat they'd filed for bankruptcy a few times. They got a lifeline with the PPP protection. But look at what happens when these companies file for bankruptcy. They do it to, to protect themselves. But what happens, it doesn't protect anybody else. It doesn't protect their partners who they who don't get paid and end up holding the bag. And it makes it difficult to do business. Right. So you got to do your due diligence on a company like this. But it can be hard because you don't know when someone's going to do that. And it's uh, I don't necessarily know how you correct that in the industry, but you you hate seeing it. And this is the second story in as many weeks that has a, had a very, very similar outcome. Yeah, I think the big deal is the bankruptcies uh, overall. This this one in the grand scheme of things uh, is very big to those involved and those those people that are owed the money. I, uh, there's some vendors that are in the $150,000 range that they, that they owe them, some other smaller trucking companies in the 32 to 40,000, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you got four trucks, five trucks, it's a lot of money that you're owed. And to your point, you know, this is the second time and they had the stimulus uh, monies that came in and, and still out. Uh, you got to wonder, can they, they can't, they're not coming out of this chapter 11. Who's going to do business with them? We were talking about ransomware attacks last week on Big Deal, Little Deal, and it seems like a wave of ransomware attacks have hit the supply chain recently. Dasky is the latest victim to be targeted in a cyber attack. Vincent, Big Deal or Little Deal? Uh, well, you know, thankfully, this, you know, they caught it and there was no disruption to their services, apparently, through the through the article. But the whole idea of the ransomware attacks, and I know Dooner has some numbers on that 49, what is it, 49 million or something like that, a port of Los Angeles that uh, uh, different attacks. It, it's huge and it's a big deal. Uh, and, you know, the, the question of why supply chain, uh, you know, I guess it's it's a it's a growing industry. They feel that maybe the tech, the security isn't there that that needs to be. But this is definitely an eye opener. There's been many stories like this that, you know, you need that security of that data uh, and and really all of your servers for all of your operations. But it's a big deal. Imagine the disruption of this in the middle of the greatest airlift that's about to come with the vaccine. You know, and he brings up a good point and why this is an even bigger deal. There's also been a lot of ransomware attacks on healthcare providers. Hackers are very aware of, of companies using legacy systems. A lot of companies have not made the proper IT investments to update those systems to go cloud-based. They're still running on metal or whatever it may be. Um, and this is just another example within Freight. And Freight is, uh, you know, we had CMA, CGM last week. You had Maersk last year. I mean, these things are, are nonstop. I mean, Falcon got hit with a cyber attack last year. That helped put them out of business when they needed Bitcoin payments. Uh, this one didn't have a cute ransom note along with it that you're going to get a discount. But much like that chapter 
9-11 story, this is just, you know, it feels like we're almost repeating the big deal, little deal from last week. And that's just because, you know, maybe some of that PPP money is running out. So you're seeing more Chapter 11s and maybe hackers are just getting wiser and wiser to where the holes are within different industries. And in freight, there's plenty of them to poke, you know, and you're going to see more and more of these attacks until people update their systems and take it a little bit more seriously. I'm not saying Dice Gay had and more uh, Dice D- Dice Gay had, but Dice Gay was a former pitcher on the Red Sox. Uh, That's right. But yeah, <laughs> so big it deal. It all leads back to the Red Sox, Dooner. <laughs> yes. He didn't really work out, Matt Suzaka. Back to Boston we go, Dooner. Uh, so MGM's announcement that they're postponing the release of the new James Bond film, No Time to Die, ironically may mean the death of Regal Cinema right here in the U.S. Dooner, big deal or little deal? You know, I like movie theaters, but at the same time, I think that this is sort of like how we talk about how e-commerce was propelled five years forward by this event. I think we're all like theaters have to. And I mean, five years closer to their own death and demise. There's only so many movies you can pro- po- postpone before there's just a glut of content. Then other things that have gone to video on demand, like Bill and Ted and Trolls World Tour have actually done really, really well. Well, movies like Unhinged that stubbornly refuse to do it have not made any money and they just make me angry. And they don't even reply to my tweets. I think they've blocked me finally. So unhinged, maybe I won't even spend any money when you go on video on demand because that's what you do when you make your customers mad. We need content. Every Tuesday movies come out, like movies are released. And I check that iTunes movie thing and there's like nothing. There's nothing, man. We're fed table scraps. It's going to be like when there was a writer's strike. All we're going to have is reality TV to live on for like the next since six months, Emily. What are we going to do? I mean, I know you like that. What is that dating show you watch? like 90 Day Fiance. I know they've adapted that to a, a COVID world, but what are we supposed to, we need our own cinematic uh, movies and our own cinematic universe, but maybe not in the theater, bring those into the home. They got to get the model down right though. They got to give people the opportunity, whether that be $9.99 to rent it or $29.99 or what Disney did. I'm not sure how well that worked out with Mulan. It got my money and Craig Fuller's money though. I'm guessing that he, he said big deal. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> After I knew, all that. <laughs> I knew you were going to fire him up over that one. You know what, Dooner? I think it, and Emily, and, and everybody out there in, in TV land watching, I think it's a huge deal. And, and, and I agree with you, Dooner. We need our cinematic experiences. I don't really go to the theaters. But I'll tell you what. Bring back the drive-ins. I love the drive-ins growing up. You stuff your friends in the trunk and and you take them, you sneak them in and you have a good time. And you got the play sets and everything in front of there for the kids to be playing on in the big screen. It's just a great time. I I, I would like to see them shut down the Regal Cinemas and bring back the uh, the drive-ins and, and watch it that way. Really a good time. You know, theater, I mean, theater experience has been under under siege anyway. You know, whenever the topic of theaters comes up, people complain about how rude moviegoers have been. And it hasn't really been an enjoyable experience that and it hasn't really updated itself aside from like IMAX and those things they try gimmicks like 3D but you know 3D is just what it is it's it's a gimmick and then you have something like COVID come around theater revenues are down 77% from last year they did about 8.5 billion last year about 1.2 billion this year so you know tough road tough road but I think you know the future is going to come as the future comes Emily what do you want what does that show you watch is that 90 day fiance well, yes, 90 Day Fiance is what I watch. You got you, you hit the nail on the head there, dude. I'm not the only one. I do love that one. But I guess my question is, me being the journalist I am, we're talking about the death of the movie theater. I'm wondering if home theater experiences inside people's homes, if people are selling a lot more big screen TVs, you know, comfy reclining chairs, if the home theater business now is booming, because people still want that experience. But now that everything's on VOD, They could just watch it in their homes and they never have to leave. But you still want that big screen, look up, eat your popcorn, sit in a comfy chair kind of experience. So I'm I I wonder if home theater sales have gone up, especially during COVID. That's something I will look into. We all are kind of cooped up. We do need some excuses to leave the house. Oh, yeah. Well, this one has been trending on social media. A bear could be seen riding on top of a garbage truck in Pennsylvania recently. The truck actually drove straight to the police station, and that's where the bear was able to get off. Vincent, big deal or little deal? It's a huge deal. The bears are attacking our garbage trucks, Emily. What what are we going to do? I mean, <laughs> we've got to we've got to be able to dispose our dispose of our waste. <laughs> 
What? Um, and, and plus, there's your entertainment. There's your cinematic entertainment right there, Dooner. Bears on garbage trucks. You can replace that uh, 90 Day Fiance show with bears on dr- garbage trucks. I think it would be a hit. Well, if, if you watched <laughs> What the Truck on Monday, you saw a bear was walking in downtown Chattanooga. Um, I would yeah. say the, the big deal is that when, when, you know, when bears come out of the wild and they get on the streets, you know, they put themselves and other people at risk. That, that bear in Chattanooga, unfortunately, was shot. This bear wasn't. This bear actually had a really interesting journey. Apparently, he was inside of a, a, a trash canister uh, in, in a dumpster. He's trying to eat. It's getting, it's getting to be near hibernation. That's why more and more bears are getting more and more bold about trying to get people's trash and people's food. He was in there, and like in a cartoon, he got dumped over head into the back of the uh into the back of the garbage truck they said this bear is one lucky bear because he didn't get crushed and compacted bear was able to climb on top and, and ride to safety then he climbed up a fence up a tree and he went back to live his uh, jolly bear life so uh big deal because i like bears yeah i love it and that's i agree with you i'm glad you brought that up the big deal to me in this was the bear did not get harmed uh they backed it up and he climbed down a tree and everything was good um so excellent stuff. Mm-hmm. But Dooner, we got about three minutes left here, brother. We got some stuff to talk about. We got coming up later this week. Mm-hmm. You know what we got coming up later this week? I'm waiting for our last big I do. T- yeah. It's, I'm- it's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big you're taking the you're stealing the spotlight from me there, Vincent. Oh, oh am I? Sorry. Yeah, I got another question. We got <laughs> one more. The game's not over. My, my, my bad. So, my as bad. you hinted at it, Michael Vincent. I'm gonna have our to next deal with virtual now. <laughs> event is this Thursday, October eighth, last mile logistics. Dooner. Big deal or little deal? It's my package, and I need it now, and I need it more than ever. That's right, e-commerce, right? Shaking up last mile. This is a nice pairing to our, our retail. We're talking a lot about warehouses at our last event. Well, this is this is the final mile. This is the piece of the puzzle that brings it all together. And hey, with that Amazon news about a 75-day uh, 75 day peak season, especially when you're talking about e-commerce, I mean, that's highly factored in. I would love to see how some of the people we talked to at this event are reacting to news like that. I'm sure they're already starting to prepare for, for, for these situations, but this only makes you have to work that much harder. It absolutely does. I mean, holiday season is when you see that big peak in the, in the demand for that final mile, especially in the e-commerce. And this year is going to be just an explosion of that. Just, just you know, a, a, a exponentially larger issue. And it's going to be a great event because the last mile is one of the most difficult to manage efficiently, uh, you know, cost wise and and with that service. And with this e-commerce, doing you can't you can't uh, discount the reverse logistics that's going to be involved with the with the last mile as well, right? You got four hundred times uh, more returns with e-commerce than you do with brick and mortar sales, mm. so that's a huge strain on the last mile as well. Yeah, and the waste and all that. Emily, you've seen some of the early returns on some of the fire sides. You looking at some good stuff? Yeah, we're not just focused on the United States. We're also focused across the border, so in Canada and even Colombia. And that's a really interesting story. Um, you won't want to miss that one. Also, our keynote, Eric Caldwell, he is of XBO, recently in the past few weeks appointed to his new position. So that's great to hear from him. Just a lot of really good fireside chats. You guys have a what the truck. We also have great quarter guys. A lot going on. So if you want to see the full agenda, if you want to see speakers, anything like that, just head to live.freightwaves.com. That will be your one-stop shop for all things events. As always, we'll we'll have a Slack channel and just be checking your email so you'll know more and more if we're giving away any prizes, if anything like that's coming up. You can find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. She's at Emily Zink. That's S-Z-I-N-K. And he's at Vince and the Dude. You can find this show in your favorite podcast player by looking up What the Truck or Freightcast, where you find every single Freight Waves podcast. Download the Freight Waves TV app. Not only can you watch this, but all of the events. In addition, all of the events are uploaded to audio as well on that Freightcast feed. Guys, it's been a pleasure. Michael Vince, you got any closing thoughts for us today? I do. We, we, had a, we actually <laughs> did have an anniversary today, did we oh. not? <laughs> a Kiona? Port X Logistics 3 years, oh, yeah. right? What a- All right. Happy birthday to Kiona and Port X Logistics. Right happy on. birthday to both of you. And Andrew Silver, too. Yeah. Peace and go. love. Peace and love. Thanks for joining us on What the Truck. <laughs>